Hi, my name is Rosana Navarro de Verduga. I'm a student at Catholic University. I am going to talk to you about disorders of fluids and electrolytes, maintenance intravenous fluids, acutely ill patients. The administration of intravenous fluids is an essential aspect in the care of patients with acute diseases. They may need to be administered as a bolus infusion for resuscitation or as a continuous infusion when liquid fluids cannot be orally administered. This video gives a brief introduction to the various types of fluid available and explains how fluids are administered. It is intended to help you understand how to select appropriate fluids and the practicalities of fluid delivery. Broadly speaking, fluid administration falls into two main categories, acute fluid resuscitation and maintenance fluids. Acute fluid resuscitation is required in acute cases of hypovolemia. For example, hemorrhage, severe diarrhea and vomiting, burns or sepsis. Typically, large volumes of intravenous fluid are required to boost circulating volume. In these cases, prompt fluid delivery can be life-saving. More controlled maintenance fluid administration is typically required in patients unable to maintain adequate oral intake, for example in cases of bowel obstruction or for surgical patients in the perioperative period. This maintenance therapy replaces ongoing fluid losses and maintains hydration. There are three main types of fluid you will encounter on the wards, crystalloids, colloids and blood products. Crystalloids are solutions that contain small molecules that can easily cross cell membranes. Examples are 0.9% sodium chloride, also known as normal saline, Hartmann's solution, and 5% glucose or dextrose. The goal of intravenous maintains Fluids is extracellular volume while maintaining normal electrolyte balance. The maintaining fluid will be adequately if it provides a sufficient amount of water and electrolytes maintain good tissue perfusion without causing complication related to overload or decreased fluid volume. It also prevents hyponatremia, hypernatremia, and other electrolytes imbalance. When you can use each of these solutions, but keep in mind the tonicity when you're using these solutions. So first off, patients hypoglycemic, either they've gotten too much insulin or they're not eating very well, you can give them either D5W as a drip or D50 in amps, meaning they give you about 50 cc's of D50. D50 is 50% dextrose. So whatever number falls that D means the percentage of dextrose within that solution. For hypotension, you generally want to use an isotonic solution. So lactated ringers or normal saline. Recently, a study was produced in JAMA called the association between a chloride liberal or normal saline versus chloride restrictive lactated ringers, intravenous fluid administration strategy, and kidney injury in critical ill adults. The study compared lactated ringers and normal saline and how the development of kidney injury related between giving one or the other in the ICU setting. Though the study concluded lactated ringers was associated with less kidney injury than normal saline, the data was very limited and the study was quite faulty. But what was important about the study, it brings up an important point that more research needs to be done into IV fluids and their actual effects on the body. Though there has been no demonstrated evidence for or against lactated ringers or normal saline. Now for hyponatremia, commonly we use either normal saline or 3% saline. This is very key here. 
if a patient is very hyponatremic and they're actively seizing, you want to get that sodium level up. So that's in that case, you'd use 3% saline. But you do not want to increase it more than 10 milliequivalents within 24 hours. Now, if they're hyponatremic and not actively seizing, try to use normal saline so you can bring them up very slowly. If you notice you're bringing them up too fast, use a hypotonic solution like D5 half normal to level off their sodium level. That way you can prevent them from developing central pontine myelinolysis because they were corrected too quickly. All right, that was a brief review of IV fluids, the mechanisms, the different types, their tonicity, as well as the situations in which you Ross, intravenous fluid therapy is one of the most important and specifically affected therapeutic measures in emergency medicine. The basic basis of fluid therapy is to the increase cardiac output, improve perfusion and tissue oxygenation to ensure proper organ function. Cons. Acute patients frequently suffer from diseases that affect the normal homeostasis of water and electrolytes. This is associated with a high incidence of acquired hyponatremia and with iatrogenic bits or with permanent neurological risk related to hyponatremic encephalopathy. The main complication of fluid management is iatrogenic fluid overload. Any IV fluid containing osmotic pressure due to the presence of large molecules is called colloid. And the osmotic pressure due to such molecules is sometimes referred to as oncotic pressure. If a colloid fluid is infused and it contains particles of solute that are too large to move from the intravascular space to the interstitial space, what happens? In this case, the extra solute from the infused fluid will pull water from the interstitial space into the intravascular space, and thus even less volume of colloid may be needed to expand the intravascular volume. Depending on the tonicity and oncotic pressure of the colloid, it may even draw water out from the intracellular space. And here's what that might look like. We'll start off with our baseline volumes and add a small amount of colloid to the intravascular space. And you can see that only a tiny amount of infused colloid is necessary to markedly expand the intravascular volume. In this particular example, the osmolarity of the colloid is actually identical to that of the body, and so therefore there's no change in the body's osmolarity. But some colloid is hyperosmolar, some colloid is hypoosmolar, and so that won't always be the case. The level of knowledge of intravenous fluid therapy in medical personnel in many hospitals in Ecuador is very low. In Ecuador, there is no report on the management of complications in relation to fluid therapy. Not are there any research studies that demonstrate the same. Isotonic, hypertonic, and hypotonic. Isotonic is where your body wants to be. It's where it's in balance. So when you give an isotonic solution to a patient, it won't cause fluid to shift any which way. It doesn't cause fluid to shift inside or outside the cells. It keeps the cells in balance. So the IV solutions that are isotonic are 0.9% normal saline, lactated ringers, and 5% dextrose in water, or D5W. Now D5W can be a little tricky to remember because technically 5% dextrose in water is isotonic when it's in the bag, 
but when it's in the body, it's hypotonic. D5W has a lot of glucose in it, and when it goes into the body, the body quickly uses up that glucose, which immediately takes away those particles, leaving more water than particles. So when 5% dextrose in water is given, it's isotonic in the bag, but it's hypotonic in the body because there's more water than particles. Now that we've just talked about D5W being hypotonic in the body, let's talk about what hypotonic actually means. So when you think of hypotonic, I want you to think of little hippos. <laughs> I like to call it hippo tonic. It's my favorite. <laughs> so hypotonic solutions have more water than they do particles. So when you give a hypotonic solution, the water moves into the cells and makes them big and round and chunky like little hippos. The hypotonic IV solutions that you need to know about for nursing school are one half normal saline or 0.45% saline, a quarter normal saline or 0.225% saline, one third normal saline or 0.33% normal saline. And like we talked about before, 5% dextrose in water or D5W when it's in the body. Now the opposite of a hypotonic IV solution is hypertonic IV solutions. Hypertonic IV solutions are filled with solutes. They have so many solutes compared to the water inside of it. So when that super concentrated solution comes into contact with the cell, the cell says, oh man, here, have some water, friend, and it gives away all of its water. And when the cell gives away its water, they shrink more and more. So these cells are really shriveled up in itty bitty teeny tiny cells. And there are a lot of hypertonic IV solutions, including 5% dextrose in 0.9% normal saline, 5% dextrose in 0.45% normal saline, 5% dextrose in lactated ringers, 10% dextrose in water, 20% dextrose in water, and 50% dextrose in water, 3% saline, and 5% saline. Intravenous fluid administration is an essential component of supportive treatment for acute patients. Because the evidence is limited, recommendation on this topic are based on opinion. Administration of hypotonic maintenance fluids is currently known to be associated with hospitals acquired hyponatremia as well as did or permanent neurological risk due to hyponatremic encephalopathy. The main complication of fluid management is iatronic fluid overload. Normal saline is a commonly used isotonic intravenous crystalloid fluid. Although it was created to approximate the same osmolarity as human plasma, normal saline contains higher sodium and chloride concentrations than plasma, and its infusion can lead to hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis and kidney injury. Balanced crystalloid solutions, such as lactated ringers and plasma light A, have more physiologic electrolyte concentrations, and thus may have less negative impact on acutely ill patients. In the single-center pragmatic unblinded SALT-ED trial, investigators tested whether the composition of crystalloids affected outcomes in non-critically ill patients. Over 16 months, the trial enrolled 13,347 adults who received 500 milliliters or more of isotonic crystalloids in the emergency department and were subsequently hospitalized, but not in an ICU. In alternate months, participants were assigned to receive either balanced crystalloids or saline. The median crystalloid volume received was 1,079 milliliters, and 88.3% of patients received only the assigned fluid. The primary outcome of hospital-free days, defined as days alive after discharge before day 28, was the same in the balanced crystalloids group and the saline group, 25 days versus 25 days. Patients in the balanced crystalloids group had a lower incidence of the secondary outcome of major adverse kidney events within 30 days, which was a composite of death, renal replacement therapy, and persistent renal dysfunction, 4.7% versus 5.6%. A concurrent study performed among critically ill patients also showed a reduction in major adverse kidney events within 30 days, 14.3% with balanced crystalloids versus 15.4% with saline. 
The authors conclude that among non-critically ill adults, balanced crystalloids and saline resulted in no difference in hospital-free days. Full trial results are available at NEJM.org.